Meet Ed. Ed is a 30-something employee of a local mid-sized company, has a pretty good job, gets along with his coworkers quite well. His boss, eh, he's an okay guy. He gets paid reasonably well. He has a couple of weeks paid vacation every year, and life is pretty good. Except for the nagging sense of discontent that only pre-entrepreneurs feel, and you know that the only way to satisfy that nagging sense of discontent is by starting your own business. So Ed goes out and starts what everybody knows as a side hustle. And he works that side hustle days and nights when he has time selling products online. And he has this dream of one day opening his own storefront and being his own boss. So he works on this for seven, eight, nine months and things start to turn and he starts making enough money that he could justify taking the full-time leap into full-time entrepreneurship. So with a big smile on his face and anticipation in his heart, he walks into his boss's office and he tenders his resignation, now to become his own boss and all of the freedom that he wants as an entrepreneur. As a matter of fact, Guidant Financial tells us that 55% of entrepreneurs say that the biggest motivation for starting their own business is the idea of being their own boss. And why is that? Because they want freedom. They want freedom. So Ed starts off on this road to freedom. And somehow this 40 hour week that he traded for freedom starts turning into 50, 60, 80 hours. He did open that storefront that he always wanted and he hired a couple of employees, but for some reason, it didn't seem to decrease the amount of time he was required to be at the office. The freedom that Ed wanted was not materializing. He couldn't take a vacation anymore. His old boss paid him for two weeks to go away. Now he can't leave. Every problem, every issue, every opportunity lands squarely on his desk and he has to fix it. This is the ironic prison of entrepreneurship. Ironic because it delivers the exact opposite of what we wanted when we started. So the question I wanna ask for us to consider today is this question. Why is it, why do so many entrepreneurs feel trapped by their businesses? Maybe that story sounds familiar to you because Ed's story is my story too. I'm going to tell a little bit of my story in a moment, but this is the question I want us to consider. Why do so many entrepreneurs feel trapped? And here's what I've discovered. It's something I call the hero syndrome. And the hero syndrome is when we as entrepreneurs, we strap on the cape and we swoop in to save the day. Every time there's a problem, an issue, something happens, we swoop in to save it. And it feels great because we fix it. Now, at first, that makes sense. You have to do that as the founder, as the startup guy. But eventually, you've got to move away from the hero syndrome. I mean, think about it. It's not sustainable. It's, it's not an ego problem. It's a hero problem. And the companies that we know that are doing billions and trillions of dollars, their founders overcame the hero syndrome. Because if they didn't, we wouldn't know about them. The hero syndrome is a bad thing. And we all have it as entrepreneurs. I had it too. I've recovered and I'm going to tell you about my story. But I have this to tell you about my story. In 2010, I left the corporate world as a school teacher to start my own company, to be my own boss, to get all the freedom that I thought would come through entrepreneurship. And uh, it went pretty well, actually. Uh, I built a multi-million dollar company. We were profitable. It recognized by Inc. Magazine two times as one of the fastest growing privately held companies in the country. Recognized by Entrepreneur Magazine as one of the top entrepreneurial companies in the country. And by all accounts from the outside looking in, I was successful. My company was successful. And in fact, we were, except for the fact that the freedom that I wanted had not materialized. So the question is, how can you escape this? That's really the big question. How can you escape the ironic prison of entrepreneurship. In 2017, I hired a business coach for the first time and I brought him in to talk to me about my company and I wanted to get an outside perspective of what was going on. And it was he who pointed out for the very first time that I had the hero syndrome. Now he didn't use that term, that's kind of my thing, but, but what he was saying is that I had built inadvertently a company built on me. Everything revolved around me. Now, that's not to say that I didn't have great employees. We had built good systems. As a matter of fact, some of the employees I hired at the beginning are still with me to this day. Here's a quick shout out to four of my vice presidents who are still with me, Nina, Brock, Ricky, and Brendan, who kill it on a daily basis. 
But no matter how good those employees are, it still came back to me. I would swoop in with the cape on and fix the financial problems. I'd fix the administration problems. And, and I even fixed some tech problems. <laughs> I fixed all that stuff. And I realized this is not what I wanted. So with the help of my business coach, I realized that the skill I most needed to master more than anything else if I wanted to be free from the ironic prison of entrepreneurship was that of delegation. And the ironic part of delegation is that we all think that we know what it is and how to do it and that we're good at it. As a matter of fact, if I asked you to raise your hand, you'd probably, yeah, I know what it is. I know how to do it and I'm good at it. You're not. <laughs> and neither was I because we don't know what it really is. I spent a two years deeply studying delegation, what it is, what it's not, how to do it, when, when not to do it, how to instill trust and discipline in my employees so that they would operate and do things the way I would do them if I were there, but yet without me. And I'm happy to say that in January 2020, I was able to step away from the daily operations of that business and my company still continued to thrive. Yes, the pandemic had something to say about that, but nevertheless, we moved forward and we still remain profitable and I don't have to be there every day. I now am experiencing freedom. So what is delegation? Most people think that it's just assigning a task to someone. Well, in fact, that's only one third of what delegation actually is. Delegation is assigning, yes, but it's also entrusting and empowering your people to do things. It's not just assigning. And so what does it look like to assign and trust and empower someone to do something on your behalf? It really boils down to these three things. The first is this. When you assign the task, they need to understand why it has to be done. Not just that you're assigning something you don't want to do. They need to understand where it fits in the overall picture. And when you do that, things change. They also need to understand how to do it. And not necessarily just physically how to do it, but what resources and tools do you, do they, do you have available to them to accomplish what you're asking them to do? And then third, you got to tell them when it needs to be done, that it's not just some arbitrary task we hope somebody finishes at some point, but that it actually needs to be done and it fits into the mission and vision of the company. This is delegation. That's what it really looks like. So if this is what it is, and this will set you free, then why is there so much confusion about it? Why do we feel like we don't know how to do it? I can tell you that when I stepped away from uh, that company that I still own, I went on to become a business coach, among other things, and now I coach other people how to master this art of delegation, among other things, and I call it exit without exiting. How to get delegation understood and ex executed in such a way that you can be free. But there's so much confusion about it. And here's what it looks like, I've discovered, and it's probably gonna sound familiar. On one hand, you've got some people practicing confiscation they call delegation. And here's what, so, so confiscation is when you pull it back, right? It, it's now yours to do. And here's what it looks like. Bob, um, I'm, I'm gonna delegate a task to you, and here's, here's why we're doing it, here's how we're gonna do it, here's when it's due. So far, so good. And then Bob starts working on it. And what do we do? Uh, Bob, no, don't do, it. don't do it that way. Actually, do it this way. That's better. Yeah, that's better. No, no, not that way. Do it this way. Okay, you're, you, you know what? Just give it to me. I'll do it. <laughs> that is not delegation, ladies and gentlemen. That is confiscation. And I realize those terms rhyme, and you may get confused, but they're not the same thing. The problem with confiscation is that it takes all the time. It takes your time back. And when your employees learn that this is how you delegate, and they get delegated a job they don't want to do, they will self-sabotage. Kind of like the husband who's told to do dishes who doesn't want to do dishes and he breaks just enough plates not to have to do it again. This is not delegation and it will not set you free. That's not delegation. Now, if you think about delegation to the center of a pendulum and then out to one side is confiscation, well, out to the other is abdication. Again, I know that it rhymes and you may get confused, but it is not the same thing. Abdication is when you pull back that, ta or excuse me, not pull back, that's confiscation. Ab abdication is when you release that completely to someone else, like giving up the throne, abdicating your throne. Here's what abdication looks like in real life. Bob, I have this task I need you to do. Here's what it is, here's how to do it, why to do it, when to do it. So far, so good. Are you good? Okay, Bob, thanks. And you turn away, never ever to check on Bob again. 
Okay, I can't see you, but if you were raising your hand, everybody would say, yeah, I've done that. I've done that before. That is not delegation, that is abdication. And the problem with abdication, of course, that sometimes you might send off a job to somebody who's gonna kill it, but we all know that doesn't happen. And you're not gonna know how bad Bob did until it's really bad. And you gotta fly in with the cape on and save the day and clean up the mess. Neither confiscation nor abdication are delegation. They don't save you your time. They don't give you freedom. They keep you locked as the hero in your own business, trapped in the ironic prison of entrepreneurship. Now, what I wanna do for you today, as we finish this together, is give you, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, six simple steps on how to actually do delegation. Now that you know what it is about entrusting, empowering, assigning, now that you know to show them why and how and when, now I want to give you this practice, this actual thing that you can do. And if you're taking notes, this would be a good time to do it. This will set you free. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to make a top 10 list. And this top 10 list is the top 10 things that you do on a regular basis that could be done by someone else. And in order to be good and do this list the right way, you have to take the cape off and set it aside. You gotta really think, what can other people do? What could they do? And make the list. Then the second step is you're gonna delegate one, only one, because you're practicing, you're practicing this. Only delegate one task to someone for 30 days. It's, it's, a, it's a practice, 30 days. And remember, delegation is not just assigning. You're gonna assign it, entrust it, empower it to that person. You're gonna make sure they understand why to do it, how to do it, when to do it, for 30 days. Third step is you're gonna check in once a week. No more, no less. That's only four check-ins. So you could say, Bob, hey, we're gonna check in on this task that I'm giving you every Thursday at 9 a.m. If you got questions in between times, just come ask me, but otherwise we'll talk on Thursdays. Now, if you check in more than that, you're gonna run the risk of confiscation if you check in less than that, you're going to run the risk of abdication. Once a week, no more, no less. And now step four. Oh, gosh. Step four is a hard one. Step four is the one that nobody wants to do. At that check-in meeting, you can only praise them. You cannot correct them. They have to discover on their own how to do it. So if Bob is doing a great job at your check-in, he's, he's doing great, you look at Bob and you say, Bob, great job, buddy. If, if it's a train wreck, you look at Bob and say, I like your tie. <laughs> you can't correct him because if you do, he will never discover how to do it. Remember, you didn't know how to do it when you started. And you, you sucked at it. But now you're the hero and you can do it better than anybody. What makes you think Bob's going to do it your way? It's going to take a while for Bob to figure it out. Now, of course, if somebody's going to die, you're going to prison, or the building's going to burn down, step in, put the cape on, fix it, right? But most of all, make sure you praise. Don't correct. Bob will figure it out. Fifth step is the 80% rule. The 80% rule tells us that when Bob can do it at 80% of the way I would do it, it is now no longer on my list of things to do. You can't wait for Bob to do 100%. You gotta get Bob to the place of 80%. And when he's at 80, you know, that's good enough. Eventually, Bob will do it at 110%. It might take a year or two or three, but eventually he'll get there. And you are just looking for 80%, not 100. And then finally, you're gonna repeat this process every 30 days until your list is empty and you are free from the ironic prison of entrepreneurship. I promise you that if you follow these steps, these six steps right here, whether you're a manager, a leader, a mom, a dad, a CEO, an entrepreneur, this will set you free. I've watched it happen dozens of times with my clients. You can escape the ironic prison of entrepreneurship through delegation. In January of 2020, I stepped away from the daily operations of my business. That business continues to grow, continues to do millions in revenue, continue, continues to be profitable. My employees are still there working along and I still make money from it. That's the great part. And I get all the tax benefits and I have no daily duties. 
primarily because I learned to delegate the right way. And I'm free now. Isn't that what you wanted when you started? You wanted freedom. You wanted freedom. Being your own boss, you wanted freedom. You can have this. It can be yours. I'm free now to acquire and start other companies if I want to, and I've done that five times since I stepped away. I'm free to travel more. I'm free to go on trips. I'm free to do volunteer activities in the community, get involved in my church more. I'm free, most of all, to spend time with my family because that's what I wanted when I became an entrepreneur. That's what's most important. I wouldn't trade my life for anybody's. And I did this primarily through delegation. You don't have to stay trapped in your business. You don't have to stay trapped in the ironic prison of entrepreneurship. You can be set free through delegation.